this is a private research pond, and we're going to be hoop netting fish. We'll be harvesting in a six and a half acre pond, something like um, 400 pounds of fish per acre. That's a lot of fish. And these are wild fish. They're not being fed. What we're doing essentially is stewarding the nutrients into fish and harvesting the fish in order to clean up the water. So uh, at 400 pounds of wild fish per acre, it appears that Fish Fry Lake is the most productive wild fish fishery in the state of Montana, which is where we are right now, of course, the Shepherd Research Center. And I'm losing my worm. They're hungry. Oh, yes, good one. That's the perfect size right there. That guy was probably born two months ago. Yeah, they, they grow really fast. Oh, hey. What? That's a nice one. That's exactly the size we're after. What is that? Maybe a, we might be one and a half growing seasons old so far. Certainly. A little bluegill. Oh, that's a bluegill. Why are we catching these tiny fish? What's the deal? What was it you were telling me about trophic levels? That's T-R-O-P-H-I-C. How does that work? Trophic levels. Uh, it's basically how energy is transferred through the ecosystem. It starts out with nutrients coming in, and that uh, begins the primary production, typically with phytoplankton, um, that in turn get eaten by zooplankton and macroinvertebrates <coughs> that then feed the fish. Uh, the crayfish, like bluegills, the first that we're catching here. So, okay, so the idea, let's say that we, instead of catching these bluegills, let's say we, we're trying to catch 10 pound largemouth bass, what would the difference be in terms of our ability to cycle nutrients out of the water? Well, we would actually lose a lot of ability in, in changing trophic states. In between, each jump between trophic states, you lose about are you only you only gain about ten percent of the energy uh, transferring up through? Well, another another way of saying that is you lose ninety percent of the energy. In other words, exactly. am I right? Exactly. Uh, so for for the nutrients that go into the phytoplankton, you lose you only gain ten percent. Step up into the phytoplankton, ten percent of that goes up into the, the zooplankton, and then only ten percent of that goes into the the secondary uh, secondary consumers, the bluegill and, and stuff. So if we're fishing for bass, we would be going up one more level and losing that much more energy. All right. So let's see if, uh, if I can say this really succinctly. In other words, if we want to remove nutrients from water, we're better off catching small fish. Definitely. Definitely so. The lower down on the trophic level you go, the essentially the more energy you're, you're harvesting from the system. I just let a fish go. It was a chunky little bluegill, maybe five inches in size. But uh, this, we've only had bluegill in this lake for two years now. So from my perspective, that was a pretty good one Certainly. relative to the others. And we want to keep some of the big guys here. But we'll let them be our spawners. Exactly. And maybe catch them with hook and line when people are out there trying to put some bluegill fillets in the fry pan. Exactly. Why are we interested in harvesting nutrients out of the water? Well, overabundance of nutrients. Nutrients are a good thing to a point. Uh, they, they are basically the fuel for the ecosystem. But when they get in abundance, either nitrogen or phosphorus, uh, they can cause very large blooms of, of algae or phytoplankton. And uh, that can actually become harmful due to uh, the due fact to that you can use up all the dissolved oxygen and your whole fishery dies, exactly. right? Phytoplankton actually create oxygen, but then when they die and sink to the bottom, the, the bacteria that respire and, and break them down, that's actually where you're, you're losing your oxygen. So do you guys... By removing all these smaller ones, we're, we're basically creating creating environment for them to continue to grow, but you want to remove them so they don't become stunted, because they will continue to reproduce just if there's nowhere for them or there's no resources for them to eat, they'll just continue to, to stay smaller and, and the population will, quote unquote, be stunted. Yeah, in fact, we're planning in, um, in uh, just a month. Similar problem in that uh, part of the world? Very, very much so. Um, and it, it's, it's a very seasonal thing. You'll have these great big blooms of phytoplankton and they occur and they have 
really short lifespan, only of a couple of days. And so they bloom all at once, the, uh, the water becomes real turbid, and then they all die off really quick. And so by doing so, when they die and sink to the bottom, it's, it's all at one time when all the bacteria come in and, yeah. and start decomposing. And so yeah, it's, a, it's a pretty much an immediate thing. Within a day or two, you can create your entire pond to go anoxic, which is not good for any of the fish. Yeah. You know, they need they need at least two milligrams of, of oxygen to survive, preferably six to seven milligrams per liter to, to do well. You know, um, earlier you were telling me some of the weird names for crappie that happened down in the south. What were those? We don't call them crappie, we call them crappie. A couple other names for them. Uh, we call them socolays because they've got the big eyes. We call them paper mouth. See, if you can face Rob while you're talking there. We call them pa paper mouth. No, you will be able to hear you otherwise. Because uh, their mouths are so thin, they're really hard to, to get to hook sometimes. Um, down in the bayou, I believe they even call them chinquapins. How do you spell that? That's a good question. <laughs> Starts with a C. <laughs> All right. So, no, great. Uh, I'm a, uh, a fisheries biologist. My degree will actually be in wildlife fishery and aquaculture with uh, with an emphasis in, in fisheries management. And, and you know, you're, you're doing some key research around this idea, right? I am. We're, uh, we're bringing in uh, bringing in six miniature islands that we're going to set up in our aquaculture facility. We're going to run some, some validation tests on, on the nutrients that they're collecting. At the same time, we're going to be stocking with bluegill and largemouth bass uh, and, and comparing ponds with and without the floating stream bed island. Yeah, and, and can, you, can you give us a, a sense of why the islands are, are associated with maximal fishery production? What's the thinking behind that? Well, the main, the main thing that they do, we were talking about the phytoplankton earlier, uh, and the phytoplankton being the base of, of your food web. Well, the, what the floating wetland islands do is they, they create a, a steady state shift change into a paraphyton community, which is based off of the biofilms that actually grow on the bottom of the wetlands. And by doing so, it's, it creates a trophic level that's actually palatable to the to the fish. And so ah. you're actually in essence kind of skipping one of the trophic levels that we were talking about earlier. And that and thus the productivity. And thus the productivity and you're not losing quite as much energy going down the down the chain by switching the state from a phytoplankton base to a paraphyte base. The yeah, paraphyton, so we can skip some of that phytoplankton and go right to paraphyton which is an incredible way to grow fish. Exactly. You know, we did, we did measurements here on yellow perch. Uh, the growth rates in our yellow perch were 35% higher, the, the year one class, 35% higher than the highest growth rates from the 44 lake study. Wow. It, it, it probably, you know, it's probably directly related to their food base. Uh, within the paraphyton are, are a lot of macroinvertebrates, uh, along with the biofilms that, that macroinvertebrates are eating. It's a, it's a great transition and a, uh, a good good transition of energy, I guess would be the best way to put it, up through the trophic levels. Well, what I guess we got really excited about is the fact that you know, a five-year-old yellow perch would weigh in the one pound, 10 ounce, one pound, 11 ounce range. And that's just a few ounces off our state record here in Montana for northern yellow perch. So you're going to put me on that state record while I'm here, right? Very exciting. So we're also with, with that's with our first experiment. Our second experiment, we're actually going to look at different different size ratios of islands, and hopefully we'll get an idea of of the maximum or the, or the more better. I guess you could say that is the ideal size of the, the floating wetland island uh, to surface area. Yeah. And then ultimately, we we these will all be miniature islands. We we plan on installing a a full-size leviathan in, uh, in a, I would call it a pond on, on our campus. It's uh, kind of a cesspool. It collects all the nutrients and fertilizers from all of our athletic fields. And uh, So in other words, that's really the home run, the idea of being able to take what would otherwise be pollution and turn it into a world-class fishery. Turn it into a world, exactly. Whoa! I mean, that changes everything, doesn't it? It does. It definitely does. The main goal is to fix the lake because this lake was dead when we began. 
it couldn't sustain any fish. It ran out of dissolved oxygen. Now we're turning those nutrients, instead of algae, we're turning them into fish. Although there's still algae to be had, you know, we're not, we're not, it's a, it's a lake in transition. Exactly. That's a good way to put it, in transition. And it, you know, it, it opens up, you know, the door to, to keep the fishery alive, mainly by, by keeping the oxygenation going, like you were saying. 